black achievement in football and beyond. Following the film, please join us for a discussion from a first-hand perspective, a black perspective. My name is Nate Burleson. For 11 years, I lived the dream by playing in the National Football League. Now I spend the better part of my days living a different dream. Over the course of 38 years, I've lived my best life. That's been my journey so far. Part of my journey moving forward is understanding my past. As the NFL celebrates its 100th anniversary and looking back at the start of the NFL, one face jumped out black face, a face not too different from mine. This is my journey to shed a light on the life of Fritz Pollard, to come to grips on why this man was forgotten, and to show the world who this man really was. He was a revolutionary. He broke down tremendous barriers. Phenomenal running back, hard to corral. An extraordinary player. He was extremely quick the Barry Sanders of his day. Walter Camp, the name associated with the first real All-America compilation, said something to the effect that Fritz Pollard ran faster than anybody his eyes had ever seen. Touchdown, and the ball game is over. When Fritz had the ball in his hands, something exciting was about to happen. He could throw the ball almost as well as anybody in the very, very infancy of pro football. Not the biggest guy in the world, but tough. And he understood that toughness meant not only on the field, but in society generally. Well, when you consider what American history was at that point in time, it was almost unthinkable, unfathomable, that Mr. Fritz Pollard would be doing what he was doing. He probably would be not known by too many individuals in America today, but he was one of the greatest running backs that ever lived. My journey of discovery will take me across our great country. No better place to start than the nation's capital and one of its newest and most important museums. What's up, sir? Nate Burleson. Damian Thomas. Welcome to the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. That's what I'm talking about. Come on. Let's go learn about Fritz. All right, so this is the 100th year celebration of the NFL. And right there, 1920 world champs, Akron, professionals. And that picture, it says so much. There's one guy that stands out, the one African-American man, that's Fritz Pollard. You being a historian of the game, of African-American history, what can you tell us about Fritz Pollard and his impact on the National Football League? I think Fritz Pollard doesn't get the credit that he deserves as one of the early pioneers, one of the people during the 19-teens and 1920s faced tremendous adversity to be on the field. He was like no other athlete that we had seen before. And his talents were so undeniable that they had to recognize them. And he was so exceptional that they couldn't deny him the opportunity to compete at the highest levels. Like many of the other African Americans of his time, he found a way to make a way out of no way, creating opportunities for himself and for others. And that spirit is what's important to remember. What I love about this museum and this specific exhibit is that as an African American professional athlete, I can look at men who did it before me. 
So if you learn about our history, you don't have to be a slave to the system that is sports. You don't have to be just a guy on the field scoring touchdowns. You can be so much more than that. I want people who come to the sports gallery to realize that sports matter far beyond the playing field. Mm. That sports are an entry point to larger political, social, and cultural conversations. We want people that come to the museum to realize that African American history is not a subset of American history, but it is American history. Mm. We want people to see how central the black experience is to our national story. My father came from Oklahoma. There, going to school and working in a barber shop, he met my mother, who was born in Oklahoma. And they, they were married in Oklahoma. And they left Oklahoma and they moved up to a place called Rogers Park, which is in the, way on the north side of Chicago. In 1920, the NFL was founded and college football was king. So the new league sought out collegiate stars, including a slight but athletic young man from Chicago. Fritz Pollard's talents were taken from the Windy City to one of America's most prestigious institutions of higher learning, Brown University. Well, first of all, he got to Brown late because they were still wrestling with some eligibility issues and admissions issues. So as if it weren't bad enough that he were black, he had to join the team that already had been practicing. The teammates basically shunned him, moving in and out of the shower room and so forth. But on Wednesday, Robbie had a practice of what they call Bloody Wednesday scrimmages. Those were scrimmages in which the subs were trying to displace the varsity for starting positions. So Pollard got in the game, the quarterback gave him the ball, he went around the end, uh, made a, a zig in, cut outside, went for a score. The end was a guy named Butner who was a southern player who started using the N-word on him, and he said, send that little so-and-so around here again, same place, Quarterback obliged, sent him around the end, did a different fake this time, same result. After the third time, Butner went to Coach Robinson and said, I think we'd better let him join the team. They had never seen a black player before. So the road certainly was not easy for him. I mean, it was very, very difficult, but he gradually won them over. And when he finally started to, to shine and make great plays and, and uh, be a, a game changer, he was accepted on the team. It was as simple as that. He certainly had to earn his way onto that team uh, as no other player did. America is a young country. It's a great country, but it wasn't always a country for everybody. Racism was a disease that afflicted the whole country. And while no place was immune, there were certain colleges that did accept African-Americans. I mean, if you were an African-American at an Ivy League school, then that means you were a leg up on African-Americans in the ACC, oh wait, because there were none. Or in the SEC, oh wait, because there were none. Or in with the old Southwest Conference, oh wait, because there were none. So you basically had African-Americans going to school and being able to compete. In what, three conferences? I guess you clearly had, you had the Ivy League, you had the Big Ten, you had the Pac-8. The Ivy League probably had as many who had prominent roles as any of those leagues. As we sit here on the steps of Brown, there's one question that keeps popping in my head. How did a young black kid from Chicago in 1915 end up here at Brown University? Well, he bounced around. He had, his, his older brother was at Dartmouth. He had played football for Dartmouth. And from what I understand, I've heard, Leslie was a better ball player than my grandfather. What? Yes, that's what I heard. So, my, you know, I, I grew up hearing that. And he taught my <laughs> grandfather how to play. He, first he went to Dartmouth because that's where Leslie was. Yeah. And he wanted to be with Leslie. And Leslie said, no, this isn't the school for you. He came down here finally, and he came to Brown. The football players gave him a hard time at first. 
they gave him the last uniform they had, right. which was all torn up and everything, had holes in it. That night, my grandfather stitched everything up, patched all the holes. And he was the only black guy on the team. Only black guy. Can you imagine being thrust in the area where basically you're the only one? Mm. It's shocking. His personality was so bubbling yeah. that basically he won people over. He dug in and wanted to open the doors for everybody to prove that everyone, no matter what color your skin is, you're an equal. Mm -hmm. Everyone should be given a chance. Fritz made the most of his chance at Brown, leading the school to his first and only Rose Bowl, becoming the first African-American to play in the granddaddy of them all. In the following season, he was even better. The 1916 team was Brown's best team to date in history. They had six shutouts in nine games. We had never beaten Harvard. They blew Harvard out of Harvard Stadium. 21-0, Fritz had an amazing game. They called him the human torpedo because he ran low to the ground. He had a dodge step that would put people on the ground grasping at air. 148 yards and two touchdowns in the Harvard win. Coupled with 144 yards and a touchdown in the win over Yale, two teams Brown had never beat in the same season. Led to Fritz becoming the first African-American back to be named to Walter Camp's All-American team and cemented his place as a Brown legend. Dr. Mackey. Hey. How you doing, Nate Burleson? Pleasure, pleasure. Peter Mackey, class of 59. Class of 59. I hear you're the one to come to if I want to learn more about Fritz Pollard. Uh, I know a little bit about Fritz Pollard. That's true. All right, well, let's do this. Okay, let's take a walk. So what can you tell me about the man known as the human torpedo? torpedo. Well, he was an outstanding, outstanding football player, but more importantly, in my view, he was an outstanding human being, and that counts for a lot. He devoted his life to helping minorities, and he was a very, very loyal Brown alum. Uh, he stayed close to Brown all his life, and... Uh, helped uh, kids come to Brown. What have you heard about his times here as an athlete and as a student on this campus back in 1915? Paul had changed the fortunes of that team. Never had beaten Harvard. But even, and this is an important footnote, even though he was the hero of the campus, President Fonts stood right down there and pointed over and said, young Fred, he called him Fred, young Fred Pollard, he's as good as a white man which was an unbelievably racially insensitive comment, but he didn't know At anybody. At the time, seemed he didn't like know a anybody. compliment, no, right? right. He, because right. of the day right. and age it was right. in. Right. Now, everybody knew he was better than anybody on that team. In the Yale Bowl, he was serenaded by the Blackbird song. Correct. Can you explain that a little bit more? Well, the Blackbird song was a derisive song. It haunted him all his life. Later, mm. when he was in his late 80s, frail sitting there on a couch with with James Missioner being interviewed and Missioner leaned over and said they sang songs about you didn't they and Fritz said yeah bye bye blackbird and then he then he proceeded to go ba 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 bye bye blackbird Bye bye blackbird da 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 be da ba ba da ba Buddy up, bye, 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 Blackbird. And the tears started coming down his cheeks. And it was clear that as much as he tried to get past that and put it aside, the, the hurt was still there. Years and years later, which is a lesson to everybody. And when I think about Paul and his legacy, I, my feeling is what he taught us was how to be the best person we can be, how to how to deal with all kinds of all kinds of crapola which people threw at him, yep. and still be positive about life. He was a positive life force, mm. um, and he wanted us all to be the best person we could be. Even though I didn't know him, right. I've I've really taken that to heart, and I think that he was a great role model because he really empowered people around him. The National Football League began on September 17, 1920 in Canton, Ohio. So there were 14 teams that actually began in the league. 
An interesting thing, after the meeting was over, the uh, newspaper coverage, which was it was modest, it was, it was a new venture, not a lot of hype around it, uh, but there was three reasons announced in the newspaper accounts of why these gentlemen founded the, the, what became the National Football League. And those three reasons cited were to combat players' high salary demands, to prevent players from jumping from team to team, and to protect college eligibility. 100 years later, how are we doing? Same issues. In the mid-20s, after New York came in, after Tim Maurer bought the Giants franchise for something like $500 or $2,500, they started the season with 22 teams and ended the season with 12 teams. And there were literally dozens of teams in the NFL in the 30s, in the 20s and 30s. So when you talk about the NFL and what kind of a league it was, that's the first thing you need to understand is there were new people and new teams, new coaches, new players every year almost for the first 15 years or so. It really didn't stabilize until I think in the mid 30s, late 30s. Into this shaky new league came Fritz Pollard and his magnetic talent brought instant credibility. After I finished at Brown and I went down to University of Pennsylvania and I studied dentistry, I went to Cleveland, Ohio to finish my senior year in dental college. And they came to me by playing pro football. And they made me a pretty good offer. So I finally went out with Akron and, and began playing pro football. Fritz Pollard began his pro career uh, with the Akron Pros, first in the pre-NFL year of 1919. Everybody knew, knew of his great ability, and he was a draw. He was a someone that pro football needed to help their gates. This was a very young, struggling league. But in 1919, when he came, there wasn't even a league yet. So uh, he played in Akron. He stayed with Akron when they joined as charter members of the National Football League. And there was really two players at the time, both in Ohio, who were our marquee drawing names. One was Fritz Pollard and the other was Jim Thorpe. Like Fritz Pollard, Jim Thorpe stood out in those early days. He was a Native American who faced his own racial discrimination, even though he was considered the greatest athlete of his time. Thorpe and Fritz were marquee names, transcending the color of their skin. He was hired by Akron's owner, and he was signed. Back there in, in, you know, 1919, $1,500 a game was an exorbitant amount of money for somebody to make. The only other person that was making that kind of money was Thorpe. So for my grandfather to be making the same amount of money as Thorpe, that really was putting on how much he was worth. And for Akron to go out the first year and they were the first undefeated championship team in the NFL. They were 8-0-3. And of course, the team that they beat was Thorpe's team, the Canton Bulldogs. I always thought what is amazing about that first team is that that was a very, very thrown together early example of what professional football would be. So many of these teams were like town teams. If you had a good base of football in your area, you had a chance to be a good team. The Akron pros, they didn't care. They didn't have to be from Akron. And I think that that's one of the things that made this team so good early on. His role was probably the biggest offensive weapon on that team, which is why he was on that first all-pro team. Fritz is also kind of the litmus test for the other few 13 total uh, black players from 1920 to 33. Fritz was the guy that would help guide them as to what cities they could play in and help them along in terms of what the expectations might be. You can draw a direct line between the brotherhood Fritz nurtured back in 1920 and the one we have in the game today. What's up, big fella? What's up, what's up? How you doing, man? You know, another blessed day. I hear you, man. I can't, I can't complain about too much, you know? So we're here celebrating another great season for you, another great season for the NFL, and also celebrating year 100. But that got me thinking on the beginning of the NFL. And I'm learning about Fritz Pollard, so I got to ask, what do you know about Fritz Pollard? You know, Pollard's been in the league for 13 years. 
Uh, you just go through the living legends. And what you say, Fritz Pollard, I'd say, you know, Jackie Robinson. Like, mm. you put them in just somebody who broke barriers, who did what they did on the football side. Now, beyond that, you're like, well, like, when did he play? Somewhere in the 1920s? <laughs> right, right, like, what, right. like, what exactly happened to him? Like, why don't we know more about Fritz? That's, yeah. that's about where my knowledge stops. Yeah, 1915, he was a young man that went to Brown and was one of the first to accomplish so many different things before he got into the league. Have you encountered racism early on in your life or even in the league? Way later on in my life. Like, you know, as a West Coast kid, you don't catch those vibes. Like, Wait, so your biggest... later on, you mean, like, as an adult while you were in the league? Yeah. I'm talking oh, about absolutely. the field. No, no, absolutely. Really? So, right when I first got to uh, the South, you know, mm. um, the first offseason I was out in uh, Alabama, get pulled over, you know, windows are tinted. And you'd be like, all right, so that's why I got pulled over, windows tinted. As soon as, you know, you roll down the window and he realizes, you know, it's not even whatever. Hopefully it's because I'm a 6'4", 285 pound man. I know man. what's happening next. It happened to me too. Get out the car. Huh? Right. So whose car is this? Mm. Mine. Right. Like, why, why would this question even be asked? Do you think now, in 2020, the NFL and the sport of football has united us a little bit more? As fans, I think you compartmentalize that. At one point, fans love you because of the sport you play, because of what you do. But that doesn't separate them. Like, after you take off your helmet, after they take off their fan jersey, they're who they are and they're, we're who we after are. After we take our jersey off, we're still black. Right. When you look at yourself, because I know you, man, you're a ball player, a businessman, a family man, philanthropist. You do it all. Do you think an individual like Fritz Pollard gets the credit he deserves for Let's just call it what it is. Being kicking, the first. Kicking down the door for us. Um, absolutely not. I mean, you know, you, you talk about Jackie Robinson, but for, you know, every Jackie Robinson who was the first NHL player, the right. first black NHL player. We're not highlighting everybody. We got to tell these stories. Right. Since Fritz Pollard stood for equality in a time where he wasn't equal, and so many years later, we're still trying to find that equality, what are you doing, not just in the game of football, but in the game of life, to help unite and keep Fritz's spirit alive? Probably every off day I have during the season, I'm out in the community, mm. talking to kids about academics, talking to kids about playing sports, talking to kids about being active. I'm always in some sort of elementary, I'm always in some sort of middle school, um, pushing forward for a positive image. And it's not just about African Americans, it's not just about Latinos, it's not mm. just about Asians, it's about the culmination of what we have. Mm. I figure it's sort of like the pay it forward program. The more positivity I put out into the world, the more they see somebody like me, somebody who, you know, is is an African-American, somebody who is yeah. a, a dad, somebody who is somebody's brother, somebody. So you look, I'm trying to make them look beyond color. Because at the end of the day, if we can all see each other just as another person, yeah. and then another person of color, that's only going to help the next person over. America in the Roaring Twenties was a country on the rise. Jazz filled the streets. Cities were booming. And sports enjoyed a golden age. It was also a country engulfed by racism. This was the world Fritz Pollard lived in. And life in the NFL was a reflection of America at large. 1921, uh, there were 59 African Americans lynched in this country. Uh, so when you, when you put that in perspective, Jim Crow w was at its highest at that particular time. To imagine what he went through during that time, where he had to sleep, where he had to eat, uh, just in terms of traveling around with his football team and enduring all that is something special. Playing football, he endured abuse, physical, as well as emotional, verbal, from teammates, from opponents, on the field, off the field. On the field, he was abused when tackled heavily, so much so that he developed this method of flipping onto his back as soon as he was tackled and cycling his feet like he's riding a bicycle up into the air and then flipping up as he's doing it, such that anybody who's trying to attack him while he's down will catch a cleat, you know, to the chest or, or to the head. That was his means of protecting himself on the field. There were reports of him getting hit high and getting hit low and, and people trying to break him in half. He had to endure that. He didn't get along very well with Jim Thorpe. When they first met at the first time they played, Thorpe walks up to him and says, N-word, you know who I am? And my grandfather used the N-word right back at him and said, yes, I know who you are. Do you know who I am? And Thorpe was just totally put back by that. And he used the N-word again, said, I'm going to kill you. And 
my grandfather said, well, if you are, after the kickoff, I'll be standing down there in your end zone, so I'll be waving at you. After the game, Thorpe came up to my grandfather and said, you've got an awful lot of nerve talking to me like that. These derogatory comments, the unfairness, all of these things he had to endure. The NFL would not be proud of the way that Fritz had to break down the taboos and perform. And so we try to put behind us those things that don't make the country look good. But I think by recognizing the things that happened to him and how he overcame them can be an inspiration, not only to the African Americans, but to people at large. Despite constant verbal and physical abuse, Fritz was feared as a competitor and respected as a leader. This was shown in a move that was revolutionary, not only in professional sports, but in America in general. In 1921, he becomes Akron's head coach. The way he became head coach really was because they knew that he understood the game. He played college, major college football. He got to Akron, management just felt that you know, we have an asset here we need to use. He knows the Brown system was very effective. People understood it, players liked it. This was something that just made all the sense in the world. And he was a leader. That was the other thing that uh, I think uh, Fritz is maybe undersold on and what a leader he was. I think it's almost unheard of to have an African-American man be the uh, head coach of a NFL football team back in 1920. For African-Americans during that time to be in control or or to be the leaders of anything, it was it was just hard to do. And for him to be able to be the first African-American coach and be a player at the same time, it just shows you the type of temperament he had, the type of character that he had, the type of intelligence he had to be able to handle something like that. It always impressed me and borderline stunned me that in 1921, when Fritz Pollard was named the player coach of the Akron pros, that he was still not totally accepted in Akron as a star of this team. It didn't matter that he had been one of the best players in the league in 1920. That didn't matter. And it was so difficult for him at times, even in this position of great authority and as a star of this championship team, that he used to have to have security at their games and they made sure that he didn't come to the games too early because they were worried about an incident. And I simply can't imagine being in charge of a team of men at age 27, never mind fearing that something might happen to you because you're black and the larger society, many of them, do not want you in that position of authority. Well, if you talk about respect having to be earned, I mean, every drop of it had to be earned if you were black and trying to lead white men at that point in our history as a country. You know, you think about how daunting that must have been. I mean, we were only a few decades after the Civil War when the country wasn't even sure it wanted to allow black soldiers to fight for a black soldier. So for a coach like Fritz Pollard, who did not have physical stature, we're talking about somebody who was like five foot seven, 150, 160 pounds tops, uh, to come in and command, that was just an extraordinary thing. When you think about the lack of sort of support resources that Fritz Pollard had in the 1920s, it's unthinkable. They did allow me to change the system and bring in a. Uh, uh, more a system that was better than what they've been playing. And I wanted the honor of having, being the first black coach more than anything else. A century later, Fritz's coaching legacy and work live on, thanks to an alliance that bears his name. In the fall of 2002, the late Johnny Cochran and I put out a report, black coaches in the NFL, superior performance, inferior opportunities. That triggered this whole movement mm. and brought all this national attention on this issue. I had a deep study with statistics and showed that the black coaches were actually winning more often, the few that had the opportunities, right. went to the playoffs twice as often, but then had fewer opportunities. 
We started to challenge the National Football League to do better when it came to hiring minority coaches, general managers, scouts, you know, throughout all the organizations. Now there's plenty of men and women that right. have been an intricate part for the advancement of colored people. Right. Why name the alliance in Fritz's honor? I had happened to read a little bit about Fritz Pollard right. and realized there was a sensational African-American player in the 1920s and so I'm like, well, why not reclaim the history? We had a meeting at the Combine. I thought we'd get 10 people to show up, but they came by the dozens. Wow. And it was standing room only. We, didn't, we barely had enough room. And these are the minority coaches, yeah. the scouts. They all wanted to hear about this movement and be part of it. And John Wooten, the all-pro uh, lineman with the Cleveland yeah. Browns and best friend with Jim Brown, was kind of the spiritual leader. And what I pointed out is for this movement to last, yeah. it needs an affinity group of minority coaches, scouts, and so forth. And when I said that, the first reaction was, heads are gonna roll. Mm -hmm. Terry Robisky, to his credit, stood up and said, if heads are gonna roll, let my head roll. Mm. And then Ted Cottrell stood up, the defense coordinator. He said, if heads are gonna roll, let my, let my head roll. One by one, wow. everybody stood up and said, we've got to get behind this. And Coach Dungy said, Cyrus has a plan, let's get behind it. And once that happened, the concept was formed. Do you believe that we have made the proper steps in the NFL to give coaches of color the right opportunities? hundred years after this kind of vitriolic racism, the country has not fully recovered and we still have a, a bias that's systemic in our society on racial grounds. Yep. And that's something I've been fighting my whole career. Just to give people an equal chance, just to give people a level playing field. There was one organization that showed leadership when Johnny and I challenged them, it was the National Football League, because they took it as hey, you know what? We could turn this into an opportunity. We could do better. Yeah. And we've been at the table, the Fritz Pollard Alliance, ever since. Mm. So what have we achieved? First of all, we got them to agree to our proposal, which was to interview at least one minority candidate for every head coach vacancy. We got it extended to general managers. We got them to enforce it the, when the first time there was a violation about it. We haven't made strides. Have there been bumps in the road? Yes. So we have a lot of work to do. I mean, we could not have picked a better namesake. We've worked with the Fritz Pollard Alliance now for years. They have been a great voice of wisdom, of checks and balances, because they're an independent organization. We work together. We find solutions and we find a better way to do things. And ultimately, our objective is the same and we have aligned interests, which is to bring the best possible people into the National Football League. The Fritz Pollard Alliance is moving the conversation into the 21st century, but progress isn't easy and it rarely moves in a straight line. After Fritz made NFL history, the league took a huge step backwards, playing from 1934 to 1946 without any black players. When you get to the late 20s, you see a segregation attitude. There were riots in the, in the early 20s, race riots that probably exceeded or matched what happened in the mid-60s in America. So it, it was a societal change that led to a change in, in NFL. Plus, there were new owners with different attitudes. During that period, there was a so-called gentleman's agreement among NFL owners that they would not hire or employ black players during that period, and that's when the game suffered. Most of the owners were gonna be in lockstep. They looked back and they said there was no ban on colored, Negro, black, African-American participation, but of course there was. And George Preston Marshall, the owner of the Redskins, uh, I mean, he held the line as long as any owner in professional sports. He held the line until the early 1960s, playing in a publicly funded new stadium in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, until uh, the attorney general, a young man named Robert Kennedy, said either you will integrate this team or you will be thrown out of the stadium. You won't be able to use this stadium funded publicly. And so George Preston Marshall, whose own 
fight song included the words fight for old Dixie, changed to now fight for old DC. That was changed sometime, probably not even until the late 60s or 70s. But fight for old DC was fight for old Dixie, fight for the South. Back in, in those years, let's face it, I mean, the, the country was still very deeply divided in terms of race. The mindset back then, it was a hell of a lot different than it is now, obviously. And there were people who just uh, made it happen, and it never should have happened, and that was the, the tenor of the times. The times were unkind to Fritz Pollard. After 1926, he would never play or coach in the NFL again. And the league would not see another African-American head coach until 1989. Hey, hey, what's up? Great one, how you doing? I'm good, how you oh, doing? Oh man, Reno's finest. Oh, look at you, <laughs> man. Appreciate the hospitality. Oh, uh, well, come on in here, man. Art, it feels like a museum down here. It's a lot of history here. This is what a legacy looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Early on in my career, we had a preseason game in, at the Hall of Fame. So we going through the hall. There was this little machine on the side. I looked at it. And, so I punched the button. There was this black guy. I'd never seen a black football player from way back before. I had to find out who this was. I read it. His name was Fritz Pollard. And I kept punching that button. I must have did it 25 times <laughs> to make it go back and forth all over again. And then I would call my teammates. Guys, come over here. Take a look at this. This guy played back in 1920. Can you believe that? 1920, we never knew that. Why did you find it important to set the record straight when people kept asking you about being the first black head coach? Because he was the first. Mm. Well, I can imagine disrespect. Who are you? Mm. You gonna coach me? You gonna play with us? That's not gonna happen. And he probably responded, we shall see. Mm. And he went about doing his work, showing him that he was capable of playing Showing, that, showing them that he was also capable of leading them as a coach. So he made his presence felt. What issues did you face as the second black head coach in the NFL? When I got the job, I felt that I would get some pushback from, from around the country. But this country, I felt, had evolved at that time where they could accept me. And I remember the first game we played against the New York Jets on Monday Night Football. History will be made tonight, the first time that we have had a black head coach in the National Football League. There he is, Art Shell. Al Davis was a cunning man. He made the decision to hire me before a Monday night football game. Just think about that. He made that change because he knew nationally everyone would be watching. Art Shell has won in his Raider debut. He is no longer the first black coach in the NFL. He's just a winning coach right now. So we win the game. Mail started to come in. I only got five bad letters. And one of them said, and we made history that night also. Johnny Greer, official referee, first black referee. Wow. He was official that game. And after the game, I got a letter that said, you and your nigger referee cheated and won the game. Mm. So every time I see Johnny, I say, Johnny, you know you're my nigga referee, don't you? <laughs> and we have a big laugh. But that was historic. And that was the only bad letter that I remember getting, only bad pushback that I got back. The country had evolved and they were ready for it. Art, you became the second black coach in NFL history back in 1989. It's 2020. What have you seen happen in the league since then? Not enough. When I started in 89, there was progress. Uh, after me, it was Denny Green, and, and Tony Dungy, and, you know, and Ray Rhodes. So we were making progress, which was great. Ownership was taking a look, and everybody looks at the owner. 
but they need to take a hard look at the general managers, because those are the guys that are to, uh, decide who goes in front of that ownership. And in my mind, a lot of the general managers haven't done a good job of that, of giving guys an opportunity to sit down and talk to ownership. I get frustrated when I watch it with the... The league being majority yeah, African-American. Uh, that's something wrong with that. Something that has to be corrected. You sit down and write down the teams that have never hired a black coach. And there are some probably never will do it as long as that ownership is in place. And look at the ones that have done it. Right. They're taking a chance. Al Davis didn't give a damn whether I was black. You know what he said when he hired me? Hmm. He said, I'm not hiring you because you're black. I'm hiring you because you're a Raider. And I know you. And I know what you're capable of doing. That's why he hired me. Not because I was black. I just happened to be black. Hmm. And I love Al Davis to death. If you could say something to Fritz Pollard right now, what would you say to him? Fritz? The fight continues. We got to keep moving forward. You set the example. You made a difference. You made a difference for me. You made a difference for some others. Now we got to make sure we continue to fight. Appreciate you joining me. Thank you so much. This has been a journey for me to learn more about the beginning era of the NFL and more about Fritz Pollard. Walk us through the Rooney Rule and how it came to be. It came to be uh, really a conversation was started, uh, you know, early 2000s, and uh, it really was about the fact that there were very few uh, minorities being given opportunities to coach in the league. An attorney named Cyrus. Mary and uh, Johnny Cochran started to talk to Commissioner Tagliabue and said, you know, what's going on here? This, this isn't right. Commissioner Tagliabue formed a, uh, an owner's committee and, and made my father the, uh, the chairman of the committee. And the result was the Rooney Rule, which uh, requires that each team that has a head coach opening uh, interview at least one minority candidate uh, for an open position. And, uh, you know, it's evolved somewhat from there, but that was, that was the beginning. It seems that the NFL was somewhat ahead of the game and um, when it comes to having a black head coach. And it seems like African Americans were there since the onset of the NFL. But then it all changed. That went away. Yep. You know, I, I know my grandfather had an African American player on our first team in 1933. And then, uh, you know, then I think in 1934, there weren't any African American players until the uh, late 40s. Now, speaking of your grandfather, did he ever express any regrets over not being able to do more to reintegrate the league sooner? He had an African-American player on his first team, and, and I think uh, if it was completely up to him, that wouldn't have changed. Right, you know, he, right. he, uh, he was a big supporter of the, uh, you know, the Negro League teams that were playing around here in Pittsburgh in the mm -hmm. baseball. I think it was up to him, uh, you know, it would have been different. Uh, and I, you know, I, I think he had regrets about it. Didn't talk about it a lot, but I think he had regrets about it. And the evolution of the rule, where do you see it going? I think we're working hard uh, on a lot of different aspects of it. Uh, number one, to you know, make sure that opportunities are, are occurring at the lower levels of coaching so that, uh, so that people can rise up through the ranks and be prepared once an opening occurs. I think a lot of people are committed to it. And, and uh, so I think we're, we're making progress, but more work to be done. Fritz never lived to see that progress. That doesn't mean he didn't continue to leave his mark. After the NFL passed him over, he founded his own pro team, the Brown Bombers, ran a talent agency, a film and music production company, and also published a newspaper. After the NFL, Fritz became a relatively successful businessman. Fritz Pollard was an individual who was able to evolve. When one uh, door was closed to him, he'd open another. And he did that throughout the rest of his professional career. In 1946, after a 12-year drought, African Americans returned to professional football. And in 1962, when George Preston Marshall traded for future Hall of Famer Bobby Mitchell, pro football was completely reintegrated. 
Within two decades of reintegration, many of the game's biggest stars were black. And that legacy continues on to this day. And it can all be traced back to one man, Fritz Pollard. My brothers never allowed me to even think the fact that just because I was black that somebody was going to come out and tear me to pieces. And I, I just eliminated that kind of thing from my mind. The players that played back in my day were rough. You couldn't tell what was going to happen in those early days. But I had a lot of fun playing pro football. Fritz Pollard's induction into the Hall of Fame is very significant because, as we all know, there were very few African-American athletes in the league until after World War II. So his performance showed society that merit was what mattered. The color of your skin did not matter. Courage is what mattered. Resilience is what mattered. Having a vision for what society could be as opposed to what society was is what mattered. So, Coach, how you doing? I'm doing well, Nate. How are you? <laughs> Good to Good see you. Good to see you. Great to see you. Appreciate you coming. Thank you. Now, this is some unbelievable, uh, unbelievable memories in it here. It really is. During this process, I've learned that Fritz was so much more than just a football player or a coach. Did the way he approached life off the field have an impact on you? When I went into the Hall of Fame in 2016, people were saying, oh, how does it feel to be the first African-American coach? I said, no, no, number two. Right. It was Fritz Pollard set the standard years before. I can't say that I modeled myself after him because I didn't know that much about him until right. I did the research. I was proud to be associated with Fritz Pollard uh, and be the second because he did set the standards so high. I came into the league in 1977 as a player. There were no African-American head coaches, 10 assistant coaches in the entire NFL the entire at that league. time. So we had 28 teams, 10 teams had one African-American coach, 18 teams had zero. I went to Pittsburgh, no African-American coaches on the staff. It wasn't even something you thought about at right. the time. But then when I became the head coach of the Bucks, I said, can't be that way. I've got to make sure these guys get an opportunity. And I got a lot of criticism right. at the time. These guys hadn't coached in the NFL. How are they going to be? And you know, 10 years later, they showed what they could do and they're in Super Bowls and leading right. teams. It was a good feeling. How do you feel about where the league is at right now and the representation of, of color throughout the NFL? We seem to hit peaks and valleys, and getting that opportunity is really the most important thing. I played for Chuck Knoll. He believed in me. He called me. I was 25 years old, and he said, I want you to be on my staff. Wow. And he did that because he believed I was going to be a good coach. And I felt like I had a responsibility to him to, to prove him right. Well, I knew when I became a head coach, there were a lot of Tony Dungeys out there that just needed that first opportunity. And so I felt like I could do that and give guys a chance to show what they could do. So hiring Lovey Smith and Mike Tomlin and Herm Edwards, it was the right thing to do. I knew I was going to get good coaches who were going to help us win. But I also felt like I needed to do something to help people understand that we need to get the league utilizing all our resources, yeah. not just part of it. If we're going to be the best league we can be, we got to use everyone. And I think that's what we've got to do. I was once told that when the lights go off and the doors are closed, that these bus talk to each other. <laughs> You're actually facing Fritz Pollard. When the lights are off and these guys get to whispering, what is Tony Dungy saying to Fritz Pollard? I think he's whispering, well done, well done, and thank you mm. for setting the bar. Thank you for being the leader, and uh, we're all following you. Fritz paved the way like so many other great historical figures. He did it against all odds. And the African-American player, coach, executive, can look back to what Fritz Pollard endured and say, surely 
If Fritz Pollard could make his way in this game during those perilous times for black folks, then I can certainly do it. He was one of the greatest pioneers that ever lived and had the ability to move things forward. He's a hero, and he's not a hero just to black people. He's a hero to America and to Americans and to the world. What he stood for was excellence at its highest. He was the first black player at Brown University, an Ivy League school. He was the first black head coach. He was the first black player in the National Football League. He was the first black quarterback. In spite of the difficulties back during that period, he was able to achieve at a high level. He served his country. He was a successful businessman off the field, away from football. That reason demonstrates to me that if you put your mind to it, in spite of the obstacles that you may face, that you can achieve excellence. And that, to me, is the legacy of Fritz Pollard. Fritz Pollard may not be the household name he deserves to be, but his legacy is very much alive in the past, present, and future of the game. Everywhere you look, from the history of African Americans in football to where we still need to go, you'll see Fritz. And this journey has taught me that he's anything but forgotten.
evening, everyone. Welcome to the NACP Virtual Town Hall Program. My name is Abba Blankson. I serve as the Senior Vice President for Marketing and Communications for the NACP. First, thank you to everyone who participated in the virtual screening. Fritz Pollard, A Forgotten Man. Tonight, our special guests will be discussing the role of sports in addressing systemic racism. Please also join us tomorrow night at the same time for our Platforms and Power uh, Town Hall with Angela Rye, Kari Champion, John Baptiste, and others. If you want to stay involved with the work of the NAACP, please dial star 8 or go to naacp.org to volunteer. For our phone participants, if at any time you have a question, you can dial star 3 to get in the question queue. If you're watching on social media, on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, you can leave us a message at NAACP. With that, I'd like to turn it over to NAACP President and CEO, Derek Johnson. President Johnson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Abba. And first of all, I want to thank our guests this evening, as well as all of you who have tuned in or dialed in. Uh, the NAACP, we are 111 years old uh, with the mission of advocacy around social justice. And in, in this time of, of racial pandemic and health pandemic, uh, we find it all so much valuable uh, to have this discussion. For, for many years, athletes and entertainers have lent their platform to advocate for social justice and understanding that social justice for us is about making democracy work. You can only make democracy work if all individuals are treated equally under the law. And if you evaluate the events over the last three weeks, you can understand that for the NAACP, for African Americans, it's even more important for us to use this moment to take a pause, celebrate the, the legacy of someone like a Fritz Pollard, but also be driven by some of the examples that he exemplified. We at the NAACP, we are proud to partner with many of our participants this evening and look forward to a very productive conversation. At this time, now I would like to introduce our moderator for the evening, uh, Mike Hill. Thanks a lot, President Johnson. Uh, I am so honored uh, to be a part of this uh, much needed discussion on how sports, especially in the NFL, can play a part uh, in the societal change that we're looking for when it comes to race relations uh, in this nation right now. Of course, I've always said that I strongly believe that that sports is a microcosm of society. And just like society, well, right now, the NFL, among a lot of the other leagues, well, they got a huge problem when it comes to race, just keeping it real. But we're going to try and figure out how to make it better today because I really feel like athletes, entertainers, people in the media should use their platform for the betterment of society. And of course, we're trying to make society and uh, the nation as a whole better. Uh, we got some great panelists. I'm looking forward to talking to them. Uh, one of the things that I, I said to the uh, NAACP is uh, when I took this is that I want to keep it real, I want to keep it raw, and I want to keep it honest. And I think we got some uh, panelists that's going to do just that tonight. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce them first. Somebody I'm really proud of, um, Maria Taylor. She's an ESPN host and reporter. Uh, Demario Davis, Saints linebacker, and he's also a member of the Players Coalition. Pro Football Hall of Famer, Aeneas Williams. Author and legendary journalist, Bill Roden. And finally, the head of the NFLPA, Demaris Smith. How are you guys doing today? Hey, hey. Good. how are you doing? Great, great, great. great. Fantastic. Good. Thank you. Mike. Looking forward to this. But Bill, I, I got to start off with you because look, 14 years ago, you actually wrote a book kind of sort of on the race relations uh, aspect of things. You wrote a book called $40 million slave talking about highly paid athletes with no true power when it comes to how they're perceived uh, in this nation among owners and general managers and whatnot. And in the 14 years since then, in your opinion, how much have things changed? Uh, well, first of all, hey, everybody, it's great to be uh, with each of you. Um, uh, um, you know, I, I think that the, uh, the power dynamic has not really changed uh, that much. Um, it's still a lot of, you know, black labor and white wealth. Uh, uh, so for better or for worse, that has not changed that much. Uh, we see now, um, you know, it's funny, you got uh, the Mario, uh, you know, in this conversation, I think you do uh, see uh, a lot of athletes, uh, you know, black men and women really uh, trying to flex their muscles. And I think they all realize, number one, that it's, it's about collective action. You, know, you just can't have one or two or three 
Uh, it's about doing things uh, together as a force. Um, so I, I see, you know, I see this all as just as an as a evolution. Um, there's not one silver bullet. So just to answer your question, I, I think the, the power dynamic has not really changed that much. I think what's changing is more uh, more black athletes understanding that uh, they are the game, they are the power, and if they can do things collectively, they can move mountains. Well, let's talk about that. Demario, he just brought up your name. Do you, as an NFL player, as athletes, do you guys know how much power you actually have? Are you seeing that more so? Well, I think it's a uh, it's a bit of a change of the guard, you know, uh, brother Roden. Actually, when I was in New York, he was one of the first people I looked up, and um, we've had an ongoing relationship since then. When I was in high school, my mom actually got me uh, his book, Forty Million Dollar Slave, and it started unlocking something uh, with a key um, that I felt like was hidden to to most of my peers, and even when I got into the NFL and started to to talk with guys about some of those concepts, I could see how foreign it was. It was almost like introducing, um, like I was telling them about, you know, cars that could fly. And, um, but what you have seen um, as, as, as miraculous as it is, is that guys are, are realizing um, the power that they hold with their platform. And I think social, social media, played a big part in doing that. It wasn't, it wasn't um, just understanding your power and, and how you, you can work, but with social media, guys start building platforms outside of their teams. And when you yeah. realize that you have that much power as an individual, um, you realize that it works even better when you, when you come together. And then there's something going on with this younger generation around uh, disruptive innovation. You know, the young generation, all they know how to do is create what they want. They don't, they're not waiting on somebody to hand it to them. You know, they don't go to the store and buy what they want. They make what they want. Right. And that's what you see if you look at the Googles of the world and the Amazon, why you think they're going to get all these kids who are either coming fresh out of high school or just entering college age is because they, the way that they think is just different than, than times. In the, and that's why I'm most excited because when you have that, that mesh of understanding power um, dynamic happening at the same time where you realize, you know what, if you're not going to give me what I want, I'm going to create what I want. Those two blends are, are what this society needs. And so the same way that we're using disruptive innovation and in, in creating uh, the transforming the way that we do business, transforming the way that we uh, we do uh, shopping, transforming the way that we think we need to have that same mentality in the way that we transform uh social justice yeah you, you you just touched on something right there and maria and everybody else can answer this question as well um you know obviously you're in the media a great journalist but how much has social media actually helped over the years when it comes to getting the word out uh particularly from athletes i think we're seeing um a resurgence of an athlete that what i call it is they're not institutionalized so demario kind of hit on it where they don't feel as though they are forced into a situation where if they don't abide by exactly what the coach's rules are or what the university says, um, then they won't be able to make money in the future. And the reality is they're realizing that all their value lies in their talent, which they bring to the field independently of anything that a name or a team can possibly give them that really the team needs them. And I've noticed it from the college collegiate level, because obviously that's where I spend a lot of time. And there's certainly been a great awakening. I mean, we've seen it. Um, Mike Gundy, I think you guys saw it. He had a mm -hmm. shirt on that represented a very right-leaning uh, news network. And Chuba Hubbard is the best running back on that team. And he immediately came out and said that it was not acceptable. Um, we've seen Clemson players jumping on the fact that they don't want, you know, buildings on their campus named after a white supremacist or former slave owners. And you can see that the names have been changed. And so for the first time, I think that they really are realizing that it, it doesn't matter at all how their coaches feel, how the university feels. It's really about how they feel and that they're true change agents, that their voice really does matter. And I've seen certain coaches say, you know, well, we're just a football team. What can we really do? And the reality is we've seen it a lot in sports, as you mentioned in the beginning, Mike, sports are the way the leaders sometimes. They're the ones who are 
first up at the plate saying what's not acceptable when it's come to racism or the first to integrate. And so it's been great to see these students get their power back. And I hope they take it to the NFL because in a lot of ways, I feel like football mm -hmm. is the last frontier. In a lot of ways that the systemic racism is pervasive there. You don't see it in the NBA. They've had their power. But I want right. to see the change flooding college football and going into the NFL. Why do you guys think that's the case in the NFL? Why do you think in, in well, basketball, obviously, uh, you know, majority of them are black, and but seventy percent of NFL players are black, but they don't—they don't seem like they have the same type of say so as, as their NBA counterparts. Anybody can answer that. Well, I, and I'm happy to jump in. Um, I, I, I disagree with that. I, I think that um, what you've seen in the last few weeks, um, to, to to borrow what what's been said, is um, to me a really um, powerful awakening of identity and and when you see people players who don't feel that they are a saint first or a viking first or a um or a giant first that they're a man first um i think that's a powerful statement i i think that um when you find that voice um i think demario said it well sometimes you start talking to people as if um, you're talking about flying cars, but it's an awakening. And I think that's something you're seeing in the National Football League. We've certainly seen it um, in, uh, uh, with NBA players in the past. But, you know, just to go back in history, we've seen a lot of NFL players, you know, talk about the Ali Summit um, come out in the past. I think that what we are now seeing is a rebirth, um, a reawakening. And it's a good thing to say. Well, well let, let, let me let me let me push back a little bit here because we're gonna keep it real today. Because you know, I, I think in the <laughs> NFL, I think a lot of NFL players may be afraid because they don't have those guaranteed contracts there. Okay. Now I've talked to numerous NFL players that were afraid to they wanted to kneel with cap, but they were afraid to actually kneel with cap because they were afraid that they were going to be cut because the owners basically said that was going to happen. Aeneas. Look, you, you've been in the league, you were in the league back in 1991. Mm -hmm. You're a veteran, a Hall of Famer. Uh, have you seen that? Do you think that there are there's, uh, some players who might still be afraid to speak their mind because they don't have those guaranteed contracts? You may have said that, or we may have thought about that prior to this pandemic and prior to what we're seeing with the, the unrest uh, as a result of uh, Mr. Floyd's uh, murder. But now I can tell you, being a part of the panel with the Players Coalition and also doing some work uh, with Mr. DeMario, I, I had a chance to go down to Montgomery to visit the Justice and Peace Memorial Museum. All the language, Mike, that I read on the walls down there, and this is where they memorialize just about anybody that was known to have been lynched, their years that they lived, in a particular county or parish where they were lynch. And this visit was there at the invitation of Arthur Blank, the owner of the Atlanta Falcon. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, my dad makes a statement all the time. He says, son, it's not what people don't know that hurt them, it's what they do know that's not true. Mm -hmm. Even if you get back to the league and the work that DeMoris uh, Smith with the union, the Players Association, Roger and the owners. And DeMaris will tell you this. All the writing I saw on the wall down in Montgomery, it was superior and inferior. Caucasian superior, African Americans inferior. And mm. if you think back to negotiations with the league, us against them, that's what it used to be. But because of this epiphany, because of this awakening, Mr. DeMaris just alluded to it. And Demario, guys like him coming into the locker room with a consciousness because of you, Mr. Roden. And also, shout out to President Johnson because the legacy of the NAACP, I hope I get through this without crying. And seeing Maria, seeing you, Mike, they say truth is like a pack of lions. It needs no defending. When we get the opportunity, we've shown whether on a football field or in a boardroom, we are equal. So now going forward, because that us against them, players against owners has now begun to, ch to change, where in the National Football League, it's more of a partnership, Mike, 
the Morris will tell you from negotiations, the owners, mm. as what is as well as from the league standpoint. And what why why is it important for the football, the National Football League, to do this? My coach in college at the Southern University, historical uh, black college, mm -hmm. Coach Percy Dewey, he said your football program are the eyes by which people see into your universities. What I dare say, the changes in this feud that was started, this spark started with maybe a Michael Brown, but has become a kerosene with Mr. Floyd. Could it be the United States and outside this country? They're looking to see the eyes into the National Football League to see how we manage this. I'm excited to be a part of this generation and all of you on this 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 Zoom call to say mm -hmm. if God has seen it sufficient enough for us to be here in this generation, that means he's put in us what we need to solve these issues. Well, that that right now is where we are today, because obviously um, there has been a, a match struck and the kerosene is burning all over this nation with George Floyd and now Rayshawn Brooks and, of course, you know, Breonna Taylor and everybody else. So there's a bit of awareness. But you brought up two things. You talked about inferiority and superiority and also opportunity. And we just saw something about Fritz Pollard. He was a coach back in 1921, the first African-American player in the NFL. It's been 100 years. We still don't have any black owners. We don't have that many black general managers. I think we got three black head coaches. And still, I think, from the the, 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 the the landscape or the mindset of a black quarterback, is he still intelligent enough to lead a team? I understand we got MVPs in the league right now, but at the same time, being a head coach or general manager is still a huge issue in this league. Will that change and how can it change? Demoris. Mike, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't see you guys. <laughs> Well, well, but yeah, did you ask? Me? I, I thought you asked me, but yeah, go, um, go ahead, Demoris. Look, um, the Rooney Rule has never worked, um, and I know that the league has decided to to make amendments or improvements to it, and, and I think you know one of the the, the bravest things and, and 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 best things that they've done in the last you know few years. They've actually asked the union to get involved in trying to increase diversity. And, and we have very specific ideas about how to do that. But let, again, keeping it real, there is no transparency yes. for um, any assistant coaches in, in the National Football League. There is no minimum pay scale. There is no uh, defined benefit plan. There is no uniformity in how um, teams address openings. Um, all of those things are, are things that have perpetuated for decades. And it's done so because you've had owners who didn't want to make changes. You've had some people in the process apologize and excuse, um, you know, just blatant, it, it, you know, ignorance when it comes to adhering to the Rooney rule. Look, I, I'm happy that we're going to suggest things that are going to be somewhat um, um, forward thinking when you think about partnering with somebody with like the NAACP to get out the fact that there might be job openings for assistant coaches. Um, I think it's going to change hopefully the landscape if we start talking about more transparency. But those things aren't going to happen if you have a closed system um, mm -hmm. where no one knows what the process is and no one knows um, how to go about moving to other teams without first getting the permission of your owner. So the only way we're going to go forward <laughs> increasing diversity among coaches is to actually not lower the barriers to entry, crush the barriers of entry. Bill, you want to follow up on that? Um, well, yeah, no, I mean, We've been talking, you know, every time you hear these kind of conversations, uh, you know, it keeps, you, know, you can't legislate what's in somebody's heart. Uh, 
I'm not sure, uh, Demar. You know who uh, who is the owner? Uh, who said uh, was it the Giants owner? Who who uh, he hired the guy and he said he reminded me like he, he reminded himself of me. You know now that that kind of what do you do with that shit? <laughs> you know, <laughs> when, when, when the, yeah. I mean seriously, you know, right? When when, when the, that just is a whole thing. So I think that there was something in whatever this new uh, gambit was where guys would get a chance or, or people, not just guys, would get a chance to meet with being these sort of social situations with people where people kind of get a chance to know you and uh, say, oh, you like to you like to hunt coons. <laughs> so do I. Oh. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, things like that. But it's just such a uh, a tough thing. One thing I would like to say, and, and, and I think, tomorrow the last time we spoke, we talked about this. This is this is all about leverage, right? Leverage. And when you look at these leagues, in fact, I just got off the phone with um, uh, a John Rogers over at Ariel Capital, and you know we he had we had the same conversation you and I had tomorrow when he was saying you know the NFL does so little business with black vendors. I mean that's a whole nother that's a whole nother realm thing that. A lot of people don't talk about where the NFL yeah, and the yeah. NBA, for that matter, they do so. Yeah, yeah. They've got a, so a multi-billion-dollar business, but very little that, but if any of it, goes to black vendors. And I guess I wanted to ask you, D, and, and you too, tomorrow. I, you know, and D, I'm glad you're on the phone because we don't get a chance to engage that much. Because I've never got to. Well, what's your philosophy about this? Is your philosophy basically we're not a social institution? We basically stick with salaries and contracts that's kind of all we do or or we're not a political institution you know you know uh, gene upshaw used to always say well yes 70 percent of the guys are black but 30 percent are white and so i think that the philosophy <laughs> of the leadership you know the philosophy of the leadership has a lot to do with how you use that 70 percent how you see yourself as a leadership organization you see is is this political is this just purely labor uh we leave the social stuff out of it and I think that informs kind of everything we're going to talk about tonight. Well, well you got you know, to find it like this. Go ahead, Demar. Let me yeah, before you go, D, because I know you're going to kill it. Um, <laughs> uh, like you said, uh, <laughs> when we already was talking about this, you know, and I'm a proponent for for doing the right thing. You know what I mean? And I like to call it call it straight. So I'm not going to protect my league. Either, either, either more than it should be. But when you got to look at it across the board, you know, I, I think people come hard at the NFL, but look at it across the board. How many black mm -hmm. owners are there across all sports? How yeah. many black what? vendors are being used across all sports? Right. You know, so that's what you really have to look at because especially like in the NFL, we have a 70% African-American worker base where you have a social responsibility to that place wherever you gain, you're gathering your resources. A lot of these players are coming from these black communities. That's just corporate responsibility. So that's what we have to look at. Okay, how are you giving back to these communities? You give back to these communities by, you know, out of these 18 main vendors that the NFL use, maybe we need to have a percentage of those be mandatory to be black businesses. You know, maybe maybe we need to have a certain percentage to be owners in the league. And that should translate across all sports, just as, as far as representation. And, you know, so that's the, that's the type of stuff that we have to look at. I mean, then when you talk about leadership, I understand that the, the, the union plays a role, but the players play a role in leadership as well. You know, mm -hmm. as we're looking at the landscape now, we realize as players that, that it would be much more important for us to try to go in partnership with the league and, and having opportunities being created economically in black communities. You know, we come from these communities. We understand these communities. So if the NFL wants to, to work in these communities and donate to these communities, you should have players at the table. And that's what we are in, in discussions. And hopefully we can come up with a model that can, can be replicated throughout other sports. That's leadership. All right. Let me get, let let me me get Maria in back quick. in here. Yeah, yeah go ahead. I, I wanted to add to that because I hear what you're saying, Demario, about why people jump on the NFL. And obviously I don't work in the NFL, so I'm here to stir the pot. But the issue is that the league feels oppressive to me. I'm not in it, mm. and I don't know that for a fact. 
But if you're Colin Kaepernick and you made a stand and then you couldn't get back into the league because what you were representing was social inequality, there's a problem. When an NBA player says my GM or owner did something wrong and disrespected my race, he's gone. Mm -hmm. And that's the different dynamic in the power structure that we're not seeing in the NFL right now and the issue that I think should certainly be addressed. I think, again, I'm so happy that everyone's found their voice, but it has been the last frontier. It has taken George Floyd's death for all of this to happen. It has taken the entire mm -hmm. nation to go a 180 for the NFL to recognize that Colin Kaepernick should still be playing in the NFL. Mm -hmm. you know? And so the question is really, why did it take that? Why are we here? And you guys are talking about the Rooney rule and the, that whole, just throw it out. The rule is a quota. We need 10% of our organizations to be represented by black people, period, dot nothing. And we want that to happen in the next five years. Like, just make it be bold and make statements and, and move forward. You know, I, I'm so happy that certain things are being said. I'm happy that the commissioner came out and said exactly what it said. That needed to happen. Absolutely. We needed that from him. But at the end of the day, all of these things have been pushed forward because of a national pandemic and mm -hmm. a racial reckoning. That's what it's taken to get us here. So the next step is going to have to be like really, really actionable steps that mean something. I mean, it, it's got to be serious. But at the end of the day, if there's no representation at the executive level, if there's no representation in the front office, no player is going to feel as though he has the right to express himself in any meaningful way. Um, and I do believe other leagues have been able to do that a little bit better. If a team gets together and decide they want to wear an I can't breathe shirt or sit out or do whatever, like it's mm -hmm. not the end of the world if you're playing for another league. And that's the difference we're talking about. That's the issue. And I understand, you know, this is like an NFL call or whatever, but that's me being an outsider looking in and what I feel like needs to change. Oh, Nance, is that the answer? Is that the answer as it relates to... What she yes, just said, Maria. basically a percentage. Yes. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great point. I'm actually on uh, a board that has a goal in this majority of... Caucasian uh, CEOs of corporations here in the St. Louis area, and their goal is to redevelop certain portions of Ferguson, Missouri, where all the things happen that you guys have heard about. And it's like a $50 million project. I just got off a call with them about three days ago. And just what you said, Maria, I said, what part of this $50 million redevelopment project in the city of Ferguson is earmarked toward hiring bis uh, small businesses as well as African Americans to do a certain percentage concrete on paper. I'll never forget, a, and I, I love to quote my dad, he said, during civil rights, we fought to vote. He said, looking back, we possibly should have focused also on economics. So on that call, I made sure I said, what's the percentage we will have on paper that we can be held accountable to, that we will make sure this community and the citizens of this community, community in Ferguson, people of color, that they will have access to these jobs, have access to these particular subcontracts. And we're saying out front, you can hold us to this. Now, why is that important? Even when we're talking about elected officials, it's one thing to get people out to vote. It's a whole nother thing to require certain things be met. And when they're met in their own paper, now we have something that we can now verify. Because Maria, you said, I just feel like I'm on the outside. I don't feel like they're doing anything. Well, there are a number of things that have been done. But if, if the league is able to put out front not just the money, but what are the concrete things and what percentage will be earmarked toward by five in five years? We have a goal to have a majority person of color in ownership. Is it on paper? We will make sure we have a certain percentage within five years of representation in the front office. Mm -hmm. That's when we now have something we can hold someone accountable to, because always remember, and I shared this with the CEOs on the call, I said, when, when you all go into communities of color, underserved, 
and you feed them, you give them things. It is still the superior coming, serve the inferior. But when you include in a partnership and now say to this community, you have, I don't care where you grew up, you have within this community, the assets that we need to be a part of this project. Now you brought equality and you've done it intentionally. Great point, Marie. Let, 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 let me, let me uh, play devil's advocate here. When I first went to a network some years ago, they had an issue with hiring coordinating producers. They didn't have a lot of black. I don't think they had one coordinating producer of color. And all of a sudden they had a directive to hire a bunch of them. And they hired like seven all of a sudden because they had to make up for time. Those seven black coordinating producers, they didn't get a lot of respect. They weren't loved. They looked at them. I'm talking about the other people, uh, white people, uh, looked at them as tokens. Should it matter if that is the edict, if that is in five years you want to get 10% um general managers or head coaches or whatever should it matter if they're looked at as being a token or not deserving of the job bill mike that's it well you know i'm sorry yeah no go ahead uh whoever was gonna say no go on bill because i'm yeah i'm listening to you both of you guys can answer go ahead all right let's talk let's 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 sing a duet you know but you look at what you look at what pepsico did pepsico i think this was just maybe yesterday they said, and they just did it. They said, we're going to expand our black managerial population by 30% by 2025 through internal development and recruitment. We're going to add more than 250 black associates to managerial roles by 2025, including adding a minimum of 100 black associates to our executive ranks. Uh, while 14% of the, the U.S. wharf is black, we know we're going to increase this. They're going to, they're going to re increase recruitment efforts with historically black colleges and universities and increase the partnership. So I'm just saying, this is what I said, this, this is what we're gonna do, okay? Uh, the NFL can do it, the NFL, you know, this is just what we're gonna do. We know because the wealth gap and the, the, um, uh, the wealth gap and the income gap in our community is just, it continues to expand and expand. It, it's awful, it's terrible. It's, 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 it gets worse almost every year. So I think Maria said, you have to be, intentional about this and that's what pepsico did the nfl uh could do it you know the you know any any of these corporations could basically say listen this is what we're going to do and and the problem with no. a lot of these yeah you know yeah yeah we're going to do a period there's no debating but the problem is and we see it now with all these you know with, with all these corporations it, with all hell breaking loose now everybody's kind of scrambled like you said you know, every black person in here has been getting getting called. Hey man, you want to be on the show? I know, right? Oh, hey, you want it's to, good to be black. Hey, you want to, you want, yeah, you, yeah, you want to be on the meeting? You want? Hey, what you think? You know that kind of you know. Uh, but I mean, it's, and, and I've seen this, you know, like 1968, same thing. You know, same thing. The riots. Hey man, you, uh, you know. And then you always have opportunists in our community. You know, you got the righteous right. people. Then you got the opportunists. You know, how you got. I don't want to call a particular name, you know, so it's just a lot to ferret out. But getting back to the larger point, when a PepsiCo or, or it could be didn't say, listen, this is what we're going to do. 20 percent, 30 percent by here. 20, and that's it. No debate. That's what we're going to do. And I think the NFL could do it. And and and, and again, this kind of gets back to where I want to ask um, uh, D. It, it kind of gets back to what is your philosophy about this? I mean, to me. The fact that we say, oh, 70% of our players are black. Well, that doesn't really mean anything if you don't use nope. 70%. You know what I'm saying? I mean, what does it mean? It's just, it's well, just well, a number. More importantly, it's just a more, more, more importantly, what you have eloquently described is the effect of power. When the board of directors of PepsiCo decide that they want to make that change, that is acting upon the power that they have. So you asked about my philosophy or the philosophy of, of the union. You can only have one philosophy when you walk into a bargaining session and you are staring at all white faces of owners. When Demario and I were in, I think, Dulles uh, two years ago, talking about Kaepernick and the anthem, 
you understand what the philosophy has to be if there's color on your side of the table and everybody's white on the other side of the table. Mm. So we can talk a lot about what we hope to accomplish, but until people effectuate and act upon the power that they have, it's talk. So one of the most powerful group of people in addition to the players in the National Football League is the power of PepsiCo. So one question I would love to have with PepsiCo, who is a league sponsor, is because you've made this change in your own corporate ecosystem, does Pepsi believe that the National Football League should have 35, 40% diversity among its uh, team leadership and executive leadership and among the owners who make up the National Football League? Yeah. And, so and, what does, great... and what does fanatics think? And what does mm -hmm. A.B. and Heiser Bush think? Because yeah. at the end of the day, you ask me what my philosophy is. My philosophy is how do we utilize the power that we know is there to take on the systemic racism that we've all suffered from? Well, isn't yeah. this the and time you know, to ask for those changes, to ask for everything that we're looking for? Because once again, Black is in. Everybody wants to do business with black. So isn't this the time where we have this power and we have their attention to go in there and not only say what we want, but demand what we want? Which well, is I think why. That's the part, that's the part yeah. that um, a lot of times kind of goes on, under the river. Um, you know, you learn, you realize your power in times like this. Out of chaos is where you, a lot of times, oftentimes you realize your power. And along the lines of what Brother Roden was saying, I appreciate guys like him because he's not an opportunist. He he's talking about this this stuff in controversial times. He's talking about it in times where it's all good to be black. He's talking about it when ain't nobody paying attention to it. You know what I'm saying? And his message has been consistent. And I've learned a lot from him and leaned on him. And it's it's, it's empowered me to be ready for moments like this. And guys such as myself to be ready for moments like this. And when you go back to what happened with Colin, out of out of what happened with Colin was a relationship that was formed and, and the players coalition was birthed and the players coalition has been able to work with the NFL to have over, over, over $50 million go specifically towards grants that players and owners work together with this and going into the community to improve schools, to uh, help them to deal with policing. And that's how you end up having uh, when qualified immunity bill goes to Congress. Now you got 1100 mm -hmm. guys, you know, signing off on that bill, which that wouldn't have never happened if we didn't have what sparked that spark that happened out of our brother Colin Kaepernick. And so mm -hmm. now we're living in, a, in another time where we're even more empowered to do more. And then you see players coming together, making the video. And now you're at the table again. And now you have an opportunity to talk about, OK, well, we still working over here, but now we can have even more with real economic inclusion of our people. Because, yeah, we can talk about what's going on with sports. But let's look at what's really going on in our communities and talk about like school to prison pipelines. They taking right. our babies to prison. Mm. Slavery is still happening. That's free labor. Right. And they're doing it. They're, it's happening right but before our eyes. And so when we really look at ourselves as players and influencers and affluence in society, we need to be going to our league and going to them and saying, hey, we're going to give to our communities. And if y'all if y'all want to be with us, y'all need to go with us and do this. And now we can have what what what, what uh, uh, brother Anis was talking about and having measurable impact. Anybody can talk. Anybody can do these media chants and whatnot. But we need measurable, real impact. Like, what are we doing around affordable housing? What are we doing around uh, empowerment zones? What are we doing about mm -hmm. workforce training? What are we doing to empower our, our, our communities? Can have ecosystems where they can 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 exist on their own. And so that's what we need to be using our power as players and as as leagues and taking care of the communities that we come from and if we don't have that then we're really not doing anything anybody can make noise but who's having measurable impact that's what we that's what right. we need to be looking at pepsi cola that's me, uh that's that's measurable impact what what net day 40 million dollars spellman 40 million dollars going to morehouse 
$40 million going to the uh, United Negro College Fund. That's measurable impact. That's what we need to be working on as players and as the league and having models that can be uh, – everybody watches us. We need to be creating the models right. that other people replicate. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, and Mike? It also helps – go ahead. Somebody want to jump sorry, in? sorry, Mike. Yes. And, and back to Maria's point, one thing we saw with the com commissioner, even though people are putting money out, PepsiCo putting money out, how many have actually come out and say we were wrong? Mm. Because reconciliation starts with an acknowledgement of wrong. Mm. And we know money out there, man, okay, we put in 200, we put in four, whatever PepsiCo is doing, that's great. And whatever every, everyone else is doing, that's great. But I want to go back to Aesop's fable, the golden goose. The league is a golden goose for owners, players, and a number of people. And when our brother Kaepernick kneeled down, I don't know if we're thinking about the league was literally losing not just fan base, but also the CTE. So it was almost like the perfect storm for the league. So now we get a number of years later, and it's the perfect storm to now recognize and remember at the end of the day, Caps kneeling down was to bring awareness to what just what we saw with Mr. Floyd. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now taking the influence that the league has, the players has, the union, the players association has, let's go into these areas where it's documented that there's a, a police brutality consistently. Less partnership Instead of saying, you're not doing this, you're not doing that, because I've been in conversation with owners. I've been in conversations with players. Let's now leverage what we have and now go into these areas and help put pressure and solve the issues to get rid of what I call the superiority when it comes down to how people of color are treated when it comes down to law enforcement. Hey, hey, may I just say something? I think that, um, uh, you know, we talk about getting our house in order and the league is 70 percent black and all that. I, I'm, I'm, you know, the older I get, the more I look at them. Okay, what can I control in my lane? All right. So now if I've got, it's time for me to hire an agent. If my agent is white and then I go into my white agent's office and there ain't no black people working there, then I'm going to buy a house. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the real estate office is white. Then I'm going to the, the banker, everybody, my banker, his whole office is white. The reason, you know, I'm saying at a certain point, <laughs> that's stuff <laughs> that you could also control. You know, right. the, the people who you do business, wait a minute, man, I, you, you don't have any black people in your office? You know, you go into your <laughs> agent's place. You know, you you know, uh, during the Super Bowl, well, I, let, let me, no, no. anyway, but, you, know, you know, I'm saying things like that, you're talking about the mentality we've got. Again, it doesn't matter if 70% of the league is black. They give all their money to white people. You know, you know, they, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's hey, Bill. Ain't that something? Bill. Ain't that something? Yeah. You just described why my mom is my real estate agent and my manager. Um, <laughs> but I was going to say, in a lot Yay. of ways, <laughs> what, what you guys are describing is, you know, you do want to go in the communities and you do want to make a difference. But as you're saying, like, keep your house in order. So if the NFL really does want to be genuine and it is a hard <laughs> issue and go and make the changes that we would like to see in criminal justice, in criminal justice or an educational system um, or really with societal prejudices, then they have to fix themselves first. Like no one's gonna believe you showing up right. with 25 white dudes to like clean up something or to change something. And so to me, the really the biggest first step is going to be making sure that the NFL has equal representation and has people that are in those rooms. So when they are developing, you know, whatever the idea is that's gonna be implemented in a community that it actually makes sense for that community or it feels right to that community. Um, and that's something that can easily be done. They can have rules about retention. And I don't know, maybe you guys can help me understand whether or not this already exists, but what are the pipelines geared towards those 70% of players that are black 
to work in front offices? Like how much is that considered? Mm -hmm. Is that an idea? Like, do they say we would, we want a former player pool to be working in this league because that's important to us. And, and they're, they're not just labor. That would be saying to me, they're not just labor. Their minds matter, their voices matter, and we stand with them at all times. So I'm just curious how different things like that are sorted out throughout the league. And if that's something that could be implemented and be used moving forward, because I think that's so important. I believe it in college athletics. I'm like, I think the players should come back in BADs and whatnot, like that's important. Um, and we just don't see it often enough. So I wonder what's the missing link or how we can get there with that. Well well, I, I think the missing link is if if we are a group of people that is going to simply rely upon the charity of others um, and the goodwill feeling of others to allow us to accomplish the rightful spots that we should be in, we're not going to get there. Um, right. When you talk about the front offices of the National Football League, or you talk about minority hiring among coaches, if you don't have transparency, if you have to go seek permission of your team owner in order to apply for a lateral position, that is a barrier entry that is going to keep diversity from occurring. So mm -hmm. we agree with each other. I think that the only way you can get your house in order is to allow people to seek and actually engender their own destiny. Not where I'm going to say, we've got this rule and we're going to try to do good. Actually tear down the barriers that have prevented things from naturally occurring. Set standards and goals that you will actually accomplish. If well, you don't well, do the, that, you simply hope that it's going to happen because we have something else new on top of the Rooney Rule. We're going to hold our breaths until the end of time. Demar, so, you, you speak for the players. I'm sorry, I mean to cut you off. You speak for the NFLPA and the players, but who speaks for them? Who who speaks? That's for a great them? question. So so here's here's the history. Gene uh, did a great job trying to organize and unionize assistant coaches for years. I inherited that, um, that program. Uh, the NFLPA funded it. But I'll tell you where we ended up as a union. When we were going through the lockout, I met with assistant coaches, and I said, now is the time to, I used a word, but it said, let's just say it's blank or get off the pot. And, and they didn't want to do it. So we, we moved on and that challenge to those assistant coaches to either unionize or get off the pot remains. They decided to hire a guy that used to work at the NFL to head up the, the assistant coaches union. And you know who's been utterly silent in the plight of assistant coaches and diversity? The head of their own union. So here's the problem. Until we decide that we want to grab the reins and actually ride and, and ride like hell to achieve our own destiny, we're not going to get there. So one of the things that, that President Johnson and I have talked about is how do we establish firm goals? How do we tear down these barriers? How do we eliminate the need that you need to go ask permission to, to, to move to another job? All of those things are things that have prevented diversity from happening. And until we get that done, um, we're not going to be able to take care of our own house. Well, so where right is now, the leverage, we're here. D? Go ahead. Sorry? I was saying, where is, in other words, we talk about this, but where is the leverage? In other words, where is the leverage? We keep getting back to this 70% black thing. Where is the leverage to make all this stuff happen? The, we, we, the, not, we, we move beyond the, goodness, right? We're not, we're not waiting for the goodness of people's heart. People have got to be forced to do the right thing. So where is the leverage? The the leverage, the leverage is come from the players. The leverage comes from the players, but the leverage also comes from eliminate the rules that require me to go beg to go get another job. Right? Eliminate the barriers that that if you wanted to move from the New York Times and go to another newspaper, you could simply go and interview for that job. Mm -hmm. In the National Football League, if you're an assistant coach and you want to move to another team, you have to go ask permission. 
Does anybody on this call think that that is something that is going to engender diversity among coaches of the National Football League? Right. No. That's for all no, coaches, black and white and, diff and different. I mean, so, but still, does it address black coaches getting the opportunities they deserve? I mean, well, like, like well, for example, Dean, uh, if you're dealing with when you a have smaller group of people who need to ask that permission, yes, it affects diversity. If you think that you're going to lose your job by asking permission, yes, it affects diversity. Right. Um, because there's no transparency of what they make, how they get hired, all of those things are things that inhibit diversity. Well, let me ask you a question about, because we, we talk about what's going on in the state of the world. And I think one of the reasons that we're moving in the right direction is because we got people who are non-black actually helping us out right now. We've seen numerous white players come out and speak, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, you know, uh, Drew Brees finally stepped up after Maria <laughs> had to drag him <laughs> on national television. <laughs> My face just left my body when I watched George Floyd take his ass up with Drew Brees' stance on the, um, the flag, but not disrespecting. But how much has that actually helped, and, and will that sustain itself over a period of time? Maria. Well, I, I, think, think my, I think that's yeah. what – oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Maria. Um, I was just going to say, I think it all depends on the stamina that we see from our white peers, because if we're all being honest with ourselves, we are asking them to relinquish power. Right now, they own right. all the power in the NFL. Although the players are realizing how much power they have, essentially it hasn't been grasped or realized in any real way. So there is going to have to be an allyship or someone that steps up and is certainly willing to do that. I think for the first time we are seeing you know, a vocal majority where before silence was obviously what everyone leaned on. And we all know, I mean, MLK said in like 1963 that really it's just the silent white man. It's not the KKK. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's the middle aged white guy that's allowing racism to continue to exist because he agrees with order more than he does justice. And so I'm, I'm hoping like I'm hopeful that all of this noise and the protesting and, and seeing white people. I think the top five books right now are all about how to be an anti racist on The New York Times bestseller. I'm glad they're educating themselves. But are you ready to, you know, be Serena Williams husband and step down as the CEO of your own company and hire a black man? Are you ready to do that? Are you ready to be very mm. diligent and, and make sure that every single hire you make considers a minority and or you're making sure you're filling it and then making sure you're retaining them and creating programs that allows them to progress? That's the next step. And I don't we right. haven't seen it. So I'm not going to like put all my hopes in that basket, but I'm most certainly going to ride the wave and be cool to be black for a year. Um, but I think it'll be interesting. We need them for sure. I'm not going to say we don't need that. I will never say that but we should be pushing and demanding a lot right now. And I think getting it on paper, if it has to be a quota, if it has to be certain numbers, then that it is what it is because the NFL has been in existence since 1920. And the fact that we are still having the same conversation and walking around mm -hmm. it and we have to figure out how to ruin barrier or take barriers down, it's just ridiculous at this point. It shouldn't exist. Yeah, and, and, and like you say, Maria, I mean, this idea, this idea that, you know, it's so funny how, how movements so quickly can be co-opted and, and hijacked. You know, you got all these white kids going around talking about white supremacy. Yes, there's white supremacy. Yes, our personal privilege, you know, to the point where it becomes anesthetized. It doesn't even mean anything anymore, you know. And, um, you know, people are not going to give away, like I think you said this, Marie, people are not going to give away privilege and they're not going to give away power. You know, you got the four, your three, the, the two houses in the Hamptons, here, and you're going to we ask you to share. I mean, that's not going to happen. So I guess it gets back to the, the question of this conversation is what is the source of leverage? Where is the leverage uh, in these industries? And, and really, you look at the NBA and the NFL is pro are probably the only two places where the, the, the labor force and is a unique it's a unique industry in that it runs on bodies. You know, how do you how do you leverage that? And how do you, we we don't even control we don't even control the raw material. <laughs> you know, but doesn't it but doesn't it come down to money though, Bill? When it comes to that, once again, we go back to the non guaranteed contracts in the NBA. When Donald Sterling is a racist, they can band together and and almost say we're going to boycott. In the NFL, you know, even when it came to the Kaepernick situation, you had you know, fractured the vision here because 
player A had enough money to do it, but player B, C, and D probably didn't want to lose their job. So is but it do we, a, a but do we know? Comes, hmm? well, 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 yes, but but let's have a real conversation about guaranteed contracts. Do we know where they came from? In the 1980s and the 1990s, free agent basketball players decided that they were not going to sign new contracts if they didn't get them guaranteed. Guaranteed contracts are not a function of the collective bargaining agreement. Guaranteed contracts are a function of the leverage of free, mostly free agent players who changed the paradigm about what contracts they got. So if the no, beg the Mars, I, don't, I don't think we're I don't think we're discussing like we understand how that works. We're talking about the leverage you have when you don't have it. No, 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 no. Let yeah, me let me finish. Let me let me finish. No, no, no. I'm not negotiating anything right now. Um <laughs> the where I wanted to finish was it came from player power. Player power. And and I, I didn't hope you didn't think that I was going to stop at, at just the financial part of it. The grist or, or the marrow that comes out of that, that fact is it was player power that changed the paradigm. I think that's where we have to go today. Okay, Demario, how much power do you feel like you have? I mean, because you live in a society where you make a lot of money. Um, you got people on, on uh, news organizations basically telling you guys, hey, just shut up and dribble, throw your football or whatnot. What do you have to complain about? Um, how much power do you know you have when it comes to that? And, and how how much do you want other players, your peers, to get involved to use their platform uh, for the betterment uh, of our race when it comes to uh, not just in the NFL, but in society? In society? Well, it's a couple of things. Um, no. It's not the contracts that that is the reason why things are, are, are taking place the way that they are. When you look in the NBA, they have uh, a great sense of unity. Um, you know, LeBron is at the top of their their union, and you know if he he sends a message down the chain, that message moves pretty quickly, and they're able to mobilize a lot quickly, quicker. You know, and and so. Uh oh. Uh oh. Did we did we lose the Mario? Then we, we did. lost the Mario. Okay. All right. Well, we're gonna get back to that or whatnot. I don't know. If finish his point up or whatever. He was making a good point there. But uh, I want to finish up real quick because there's a a lot of different responsibilities. It comes from the players' association, comes from the players themselves, owners, general manager. But having been in the media for the last 25 years, I think Bill, Maria, you guys definitely can speak on this. The responsibility that we have actually in the media. Uh, when I was at a certain network, obviously, Maria, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I probably I wasn't allowed to actually speak my mind. But now they're giving us a little bit more leverage to say things and speak up when we see the coverage isn't going a certain way. Uh, that is apropos when it comes to uh, any corporation, whether you're working at Gucci or any Fortune 500 company. If you have a voice, you should be able to use it. How important, though? is the media's voice in all of this to make sure that we get the right message out. I think that's a great, great point, Mike. And um, to be honest, if we're being honest, I had never felt comfortable using my voice in this space, talking about race relations, um, talking about protesting, even just talking about cap and kneeling until I was on first take and we had those Drew Brees comments and questions. And I just was finally like, a Jalen Rose said something on NBA Countdown that same week. And he said, right now the black community needs me more than I need my job or this money. Mm. And even if I were to lose everything, if I went down and like blaze of glory, that I was representing the right things and my heart was in the right place, then that's exactly where I was supposed to be and make that difference. And that's just kind of how I feel now. Like, I just want to call a spade a spade and we right. are there for a reason, right? And so now I think the same thing that's happening in the NFL with the players, I'm realizing my power. You know, Mike, you're probably realizing your power. Bill Roden's always known his power because I read his book in college, you know, like in 2009.
but it's something that does make a difference. It's needed in every single way you can possibly imagine. It's the conversations that we're able to have with the black athlete that maybe a white peer cannot, and we can relay back to the public. We can be a part of that, that media news cycle that combats the narrative of the shut up and dribble. And so I'm so thankful to be in this place right now where I feel free to do all those things. And I hope that we all like collectively, and I think that tomorrow is gonna try and get to this, but there is a sense of collective community when it comes to say the NBA and maybe even as black media members, we're starting to get there too. And everyone has mm -hmm. to start to feel and move in the same way because if, if my company or Fox can't go and say, well, we'll just go hire this other black person that won't do that, then we'll be okay. You know what I mean? then I won't have a job. But if everyone's like, you know what? I stand up for my community. I stand up for my mom and my dad and my sister and my brother, then you just gonna have to deal with our voices. And that's the way it is. Yeah, we thank, thankfully for the Bill Rodens instead of the Jason, let me stop. Bill, Bill you wanna follow up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Jason, I'm sorry. What, what, yeah, what I thought you said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, here's the thing. I mean, I was thinking about this before we got on is we could all disagree with each other about different things, but I get so much power ever since I've gotten into the business. I, we get power from each other. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, you know, I look at, you know, and, and that's our, our, our salvation has always been each other. And, you know, now when I look at, you know, like Maria, uh, her energy, her tenacity, uh, you know, the Mario, I mean, you know, um, I, I think that we just have to recognize that um, all of us are kind of, I, this is probably, I don't know if this is going to come out the right way, but all of us are kind of miracles. In other words, if you look at, if you look at this, somebody mentioned the, 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 uh, the what did you say, something to prison, what do you call the pipeline, the prison to, uh, what's the pipeline called? the prison to something behind uh back where, who would end up in prison in just by the lack of education uh school to prison yeah they all here yeah school to prison the reality yeah. is that none are supposed to be here mm. Demar, you know you ain't supposed to be here you know i'll be doing what i'm supposed to do deep you think we're having I'm doing what doing with you supposed to be because all these were set so we're we're kind of fortunate and we're blessed and we should really embrace that embrace each other that we're kind of miraculous the fact that we are here and i guess our mission is is basically our only mission at a certain point mm -hmm. in our life should be making sure that next generation of people get to survive too and we bring them on whether it's in journalism or whether it's in law or whatever it is and so that's that is really apropos of nothing. That's our power, I think. Our power. Amen. You know, we, we, we're sitting around talking about, oh man, you know how rough it is. And I'm thinking, I looked at my 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 great grandfather. You know that you know <laughs> he had no shot, <laughs> no shot. He was looking where mm -hmm. we are and said, "Gee, man, we've arrived." Which, so that's the source of my power. You look at our ancestors. And they could just be killed. You know, how did they survive? How, you know, how, how did they get through? Not, not, yep. not, how did they get through an hour? What was the hour in Mississippi in 1916? What, what, like? Right. So, you know, you know, Marie, you mentioned power. I just think when we think of ourselves as part of this continuous legacy, that's what. But I think I get the power to survive. Bill, you're breaking up a little bit. You, I think I think uh, Bill's feed is breaking up, man. I'm hey, sorry. I, we, I'm, yeah. I we we got to give him a wrap. Yeah, I, I yeah, your, your your feed is breaking up, man. Look, uh, Bill, I'm gonna end on that. We have come a long way, but we. Uh, certainly have a long way to go. This is a marathon. I think we're only on the one mile mark. We got 25.2 miles to go. Hey, this has been a great conversation. Obviously, we can uh, keep this going for a long period of time, but uh, we have to wrap things up. I want to thank uh, all the panelists for uh, their great insight talking about uh, race relations when it comes to the NFL and other sports. Uh, Maria, Aeneas, Bill, Mario, 
Morris, you guys have been tremendous. I've been honored to be a part of this, and uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed it uh, as well. Uh, let me send it back over to the president, thank President you. Johnson. I want to thank all the panels and to our moderator for hosting this. You know, Frederick Douglass said it clearly, uh, power concedes nothing without a demand. Uh, both the players and the fans, we are in a demand seat. Uh, no one is going to give us anything. We must demand what we're entitled to, what we own. And in the NFL, we own a lot of real estate if we take claim to it. Uh, the players on the field make up a significant numbers of those who come from our community. Uh, those who are stronger in their positioning have to stand up so those who are not as strong can have the ability uh, to undergird them. It is fascinating to look at the times. No one would have thought three weeks ago that corporate America will wake up and say racism actually exists, that structural mm -hmm. racism is a barrier and we need to do something about it. No one would imagine that NASCAR would have banned the Confederate flag uh, in this moment. But if NASCAR can ban the Confederate flag, it sends a message. It sends a message that their fan base is changing. In order for them to stay relevant, they need to appeal to a broader audience. It also sends a message that we have more power in this process than we give our credit, ourselves credit for. And specifically for the NFL, you know, I, I'm reminded when I walked into this position, I reached out to an unnamed player and I was seeking to build a relationship and actually do some promotion. And after going through an agent who did not come from our community and, a, and the lawyer who did not come from our community and being given a runaround for two months, only for that agent to come back later and say, now, can you tell me what is the NAACP again? I was shocked. We must not only demand what we're entitled to, we must reflect what we say we want to demand. And so in order to do that, we have to stand up in our own power and be confident enough to know that those who are around us must also reflect our values, our interests, and not just reflect the need to draw from our bank accounts. This is a great opportunity for us in an African-American community to step up in ways we have not done before. Thank all of you for joining us tonight. Thank all of, of you who are viewing on Facebook and other mediums and who've called in. Uh, we look forward to continue this conversation. Have a blessed evening. Mario, love your brother.